this time we're interested in fluorescence, ultraviolet and phosphorescence and what we can do to measure them, what we will see in our spectrometer. So what we would expect if we had a molecule, some kind of quantum mechanical system that can absorb energy of only a single uh, a possibility. So we've got a single energy level, we have a single energy level that it's going to. We put energy in, so therefore we would expect there to be a very sharp peak in our spectrum of effectively zero width, where it absorbs very, very strongly in one color and nowhere anywhere else. This is not what we see. So um, we're already in electronic spectroscopy in UV vis. So I've already mentioned that it can this this particle, this molecule, whatever it is, could also vibrate when it's excited. So we can not only excite it an electronic energy level, we can also excite it a vibrational energy level. So that would give it some other bands. And um, we haven't discussed what energy level this should be in. Never mind. Let's get to the next thing first. If we have vibrational energy levels, that's not the lowest energy that we can possibly do. Because if we have two atoms, whoops, here we go, vibrating, that's not the easiest thing that we can do to it. The easiest thing that we could do is push it sideways, and the next easiest thing that we can do is rotate it. So rotational and vibrate and translational uh, quantum mechanical energy levels are way closer together than vibrational ones and so we would expect to see those as well. So if we have a set of energy levels from the lowest possible en energy level going up, if we want to know what state are our molecules in to start with, so they've already been excited to some energy state. If we assume that it's in the dark, so we don't have any light coming in, then the only way of getting them excited is thermal, it's heat. That has a particular rule in this situation. So if we heat this up, if we excite it only by heat, then there must be at least as many particles in a low state as there are in the state above it, which means if we have um, if we have a particle up here, if we have a molecule in the third energy state, there must also be at least one in the next one down and at least one in the bottom one. Okay, it's not a hard and fast rule because it's quantum mechanics and we've only got three particles in this, but statistically if we have a lot of them, it applies. So then we would expect in normal cases there to be a sort of pyramid of um, molecules in different states, different excited states as we start off. And we, would, we should also think about how much energy do we really have, because we're only going to be at a temperature that is sensible. But at room temperature, these vibrational levels, some of them will be excited, but most of the molecules or particles will be in the ground state. That is not the case for rotation, because rota rotational energy levels are comparatively close together. So some of the mo uh, molecules will already be rotating quite fast. They will be in the ground state. For the purposes of this course, so those of you doing other courses, you need to be aware that I am not going to speak about a rotational spectroscopy very much. Rotational energy levels and their interaction with light has a rule, there's a quantum mechanical rule for it, you can look it up, um, but because we don't use rotational spectroscopy in our course, I'm not going to discuss it, nevertheless you should know that it exists. Added to this, to the expansion of our, um, of our excitation spectrum but with all of the vibrational levels that might be in there, added to that we also have Doppler broadening. Doppler broadening is when the particles inside there are moving towards us or away from us, which shifts the color of light that they experience. So let us imagine this one is moving away. 
because it's moving away from the source of the light the light is red shifted because it sees it slower than the light really is or than the light is compared to our detector which is here measuring it what we then experience is a blue shift of our absorption spectrum likewise if the particle is moving in the other direction it will see the light as being more energetic than it really is of being bluer than it really is and so it will actually absorb a redder photon than it would normally absorb and so then we see a broadening of our spectrum effectively because some of the in a gas for example the obviously the speed of these particles is going to be way higher in a gas so in a gas we've got particles moving in all directions at various different speeds and therefore we get a mixture of different speeds and that generates the line shape that we may be familiar with when we actually do a measurement so a combination of factors generates our actual line shape one of the possibilities is this the Doppler broadening and the line shape is somewhat like that now I get to talk about LAM dip spectroscopy which just like the people who taught me I have never used it's not actually super useful for anything but for explaining stuff it's really awesome the LAM dip spectroscopy is a special type of measurement that tries to get the actual exact peak of the peak to, um, to allow for this Doppler problem how do we do it? we add a mirror to the back side of the measurement container over here and we measure it over on this side and that has a huge effect on what we see let us have a look so let us consider light that's going in at a certain frequency it goes in bounces back and we measure it and this light goes in and it hits a, a, a molecule that happens not to be moving if it hits this molecule that happens not to be moving it might excite it to its excited state if it's the right color so let's do that that makes us excited and another photon of the same color goes past hits the mirror comes back when it gets to this molecule it can't be absorbed because the molecule is already excited and so it continues if we have this molecule which is going which is moving at a speed in this direction when the light comes that can excite that one which is um, bluer than the this photon because it's moving it will um, see this molecule but when it bounces off here and comes back the other way the molecules that can absorb it the ones that are going at the right speed to absorb the continuing light are faster in this direction must be moving in one of these directions instead it must have a component of velocity in to the left this one has a component of velocity to the right so we see that there are there's a special position in here where there's they're not moving at all where the same molecules appear twice in this case the molecules that get hit that can be excited in this direction are the same are, are different sorry are not the same as the ones that can be excited when they're coming back so if we take the light and split it into colors and feed this container one color at a time so we're scanning colors over time different colors not at the same time otherwise it wouldn't work if we scan the colors one at a time we will see that this in this color slightly away from the peak the sample is actually darker than it is exactly at the tip of the peak and then I will now I'll draw what it looks like so this is what's called lamb dip spectroscopy and we get these strange peaks with a little bit missing in right in the middle so we can define exactly where the absorbance should be if the molecules weren't moving although most of our molecules are moving and that is because the speed zero is special 
because if we've got z zero speed or zero velocity in the x direction it's the same in both directions whereas if we have a, some number velocity it's different molecules that are absorbing it in each direction and that allows us to measure this so we can discover or we can invent types of spectroscopy using just physical properties of our uh, of our system and sometimes the problems that cause our that, that cause us trouble are we can actually use to measure new things so uh, when we were looking at infrared we looked at how it can be used to identify which functional groups you might have in a molecule. Here we're looking at a type of spectroscopy that is less useful for that. We've got ultraviolet. It's not so good for identifying exactly what is in your molecule, but it's very good for working out how much of the molecule you have, as long as you don't have something else that absorbs in the same place. So in a project for the if some other students, the science communication students, I'm trying to measure the amount of caffeine in tea. And to measure the amount of caffeine in tea, we would like to measure a particular band that is um, defines caffeine. It has a particular absorption band, and we can use that to determine how much caffeine is in the tea sample that we have, that's in the liquid tea that we've made. Um, so how does that ha work? Okay, so here is our mathematical model. We've got layers of molecules. So this is a layer of solution, one molecule thick. And uh, all of these molecules could absorb the photons of red light, but some of them are, so they're spaced out because there's water in between. It's caffeine in water, for example. If we take one l thickness, then we can determine a probability that we will lose a photon from our first layer. Let's do that, or we can look into Wikipedia and see that. I'll um, put it up. Okay, I found a better explanation here in th at this side, site. It turns out it's a German site, which is quite nice because we are in Germany, but uh, it doesn't matter. This is just an a relatively simple explanation it doesn't look quite so ugly as the one on Wikipedia for example it's actually functionally very similar but this one is easier to understand so if we take a slab as I was saying of absorbing species and the slab has to be so thin that we can only fit one molecule of our absorbing species in so that it behaves mathematically nicely um, then we can see that there will be a probability, we've got light coming in of a certain intensity, there's a probability that it hits one of these. So it doesn't matter what the intensity is, the prob it will go down by its own intensity multiplied by the probability of hitting something that's ready to absorb it. And the probability of it hitting something ready to absorb it is the number of molecules per centimeter cubed um, multiplied by some factor which depends on how likely they are to absorb this sigma here which is the where where is it I'm trying to find it sigma is the proportion of molecules that will absorb it stop so as you can see they've used this terminology where we've got sorry this line we're on we've got the change in intensity compared to the intensity Z, which is the intensity that it is when it goes in, is reduced, so it's negative, it's reduced by this factor. And if we go to the next slab, the IZ, the uh, intensity of the light at the next one, so the one behind this, will be smaller. It's the output of this equation, effectively. So that makes it difficult to calculate, because we'd have to do it one after another and we'd have to do it a lot of times to get it to work so mathematically the way to solve that is to integrate it it's a differential equation anyway you can see di dz and we've got iz and n so we can then integrate it that's what they're saying and the integral of a negative number gives us a log function because 
that's how integrals work so then we and we've also got to generate a constant of integration so we end up with two logs at the beginning which says the log of the intensity minus the log of the original intensity is equal to the concentration multiplied by b which is the thickness the path length the total thickness because that's the integration constant so that's how far we've how many slices we've done effectively so therefore out of this maths and just the fact that every time the light goes through a one molecule layer of thickness of our cuvette or of our whatever we got it in of the water it loses a certain amount of intensity so there is less to go into the next lot which has the same concentration but it can't go down by the same amount because it's there aren't as many photons so it's just the probability of hitting one of these is the same but obviously the number of these that we hit is reduced because every time we go lower intensity that gives us this equation here which says the log so if we've got the log of intensity minus the log of the initial intensity what we can measure is the initial intensity which is without our sample in there and we can also measure the intensity of the light and we can uh, take this and package it into a function so the a log minus a log is actually the log of the two values one over each other so that brought us to this stage where we've got the natural log of the intensity which is what we're going to measure divided by the intensity if we didn't have a sample in there the intensity that gets to the start of our measurement sample is equal to some number which is dependent on how dark our molecules are so we can measure that for our molecule of interest but it stays is a constant for one species multiplied by the concentration that was the number of molecules in that particular thing multiplied by the length as you will know if we change from a natural log to a log to base 10 or a log to any other base we just get a constant in here so for practical reasons we're going to put in a constant to see what's going on and we're going to have a negative we're going to use base 10 because historically that's how it's done so i've changed some of the letters why I've changed all of the letters we change this to the log base 10 that gives us a constant uh, a constant which we have to multiply by the Sigma so inside here this epsilon this is the um, the factor the color factor for this molecule that we're interested in so in my case it's caffeine this is the concentration and now we can change the concentration to standard units because it was in a weird unit and this is the length of the cell that is measured in this particular equation in centimeters it's obviously not an SI unit but that's uh, historically this is the concentration this is the extinction coefficient so it's how much how black effectively the dye is the caffeine is in the color that we're looking at it depends on wavelength if we shift the wavelength we will get change the value of that why is this important well this side it might be ugly but this side is really nice because we have a constant that we can measure and two values that are easy to, to measure or that we might want to know so L is the length of our holder of our container how much liquid or solid the, the light has to go through so we might want to know that or we might be, know it so we might have a container that has a certain size and then we fix that and we want to know what the concentration is which is what I want to do in my measurement so I want to I need to know this I need to know this and then I can measure this directly and because they are linearly related it makes the maths really easy so to, let's get rid of this ugly bit by defining a new thing which is this up here a for absorption we can say absorption is equal to this the minus log the negative log of the cut of the light that comes out divided by the light that went in which means obviously that we need to know what the light intensity is that went in at a given wavelength to be able to calculate this for every wavelength 
that is what our spectrometer does if we tell it to plot in A and it's particularly useful if we want to measure the concentration of something because then it's directly related. There is a pitfall however so if we measure whoops, if we measure this it's the same with pH which is also a negative log to the base 10 but this is worse in a way so if we measure A the absorbance and we get numbers out we could easily forget the significance of what A really is. If we get a value of A of 6 for example out so if A equals 6 equals 6 it means because it's the negative log so obviously the log would have to be 6 so I over I naught would have to be minus 6 which means that um, uh, I has to be a million times smaller than I naught so that implies 1 in 1 million, 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1 in a million photons are actually getting through the sample. Obviously that is going to cause great problems it, on in the accuracy of our measurement if we get carried away. So for practical reasons we try to keep the absorbance down as low as we can or at least in a measurable range, so somewhere around 1, maybe less than 1. If we have a very good spectrometer, we can measure an absorbance of 6. If we have a very expensive spectrometer, we can measure up higher, but we are pushing the technology. Um, it, they go up to 9 sometimes, but we, do, we should be aware what we're doing. Most of the light that we put in is not coming back out again, and so the accuracy of our measurement will go down any fluctuations in any of the things so the light intensity our detector any measurement errors will be magnified if most of our measurement is nothing so just to hammer it in a little one more time infrared is mostly used for identification you can also use it to measure concentration but because it's mostly used for identification, it's often presented as present percent transmission with peaks downwards. UV vis is often and almost exclusively used to measure concentration of things. We can also measure the position of the band, we can do all kinds of things, but it's very commonly used to measure concentration and therefore it's also very commonly presented in absorbance units. A and they have peaks that go up because an increase in absorbance means you get less light out and they are on a log scale, a log to base 10 scale which means that they are linear with concentration so that piece of calculation has already been done for you when the spectrometer calculates absorbance. We can use infrared in the same way but it is a little bit more difficult because the intensity of a band can change depending on circumstances so it's a lot harder to make it work okay i'm going to cut down a few of the topics the uh, triplet and singlet state we will leave for next time the shape of the fluorescent spectrum we will also leave for the time being let's have a look at which molecules should absorb in the ultraviolet visible region and why we have mentioned it before but we'll do it again because repetition is good. So as we had at the beginning, this is the color component of turmeric, curcumin. Um, it absorbs blue light particularly well. It also absorbs other colors, but it's very good at absorbing blue light. So why is this a colored dye? And other things such as polyethylene, which is much bigger. Why doesn't polyethylene absorb ultraviolet or visible light? very well but this absorbs in the visible region extremely strongly. In fact when I had a student try to measure this um, they, cause, they cause a giant mess by spilling tiny amounts of this on the bench and it stained everything yellow for a really long time. It's a very intense dye. So this must have an energy transition 
that occurs in the visible region of our spectrum and the polyethylene must not because it's transparent this is probably polyethylene um, this container it's completely transparent to visible light we have all of these double bonds that are connected together so this 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 are all p orbitals so this carbon has a p orbital participating in a double bond this one does as well in a benzene we assume that there is no difference between the carbons because they can move around it's not quite like that in the chain they're all connected because this carbon is also a has also got a double bond this oxygen has also got a lone pair so the oxygen is all involved so most of the molecule or most of the atoms in this molecule are involved in a single bond and there are a lot of energy levels in there because if we use the molecular orbital uh, way of making a new orbital we take all of these orbitals we add them together and we divide by the number of orbitals that we started with to generate new orbitals bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals and we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 plus possibly those so we've got 20 maybe 22 electrons in our bonding system so there are 11 bonds in there and there are equivalent number of antibonding orbitals if we the more orbitals we have the more energy states that we have that are possible and the closer they are to each other there is another explanation of this and the other explanation involves uh, considering it to be like a string so if we have a string and we pluck it we can have a harmonic freq uh, frequency we can have different frequencies that fit inside there if we make the string longer like that the energy of the lowest frequency wavelength goes down so the lowest the lowest frequency that we can fit on there which will be half a wave is lower if we have a longer bond because it's lower it pushes all of the energies lower in this case we've got a very large pi system and its energy is very low and its excited state energy is also very low and so this appears in the visible region of the optical spectrum this di this dye is particularly interesting because if we leave it out in the sun those of you who eat things containing turmeric will know this if you put this out in the sun it bleaches it becomes completely colorless again so it starts off being strongly colored particularly in um, conditions where this form can occur uh, uh, this double bond can shift onto the oxygen but it breaks then our double si bond system into two let's do that so in this form the diketone form this carbon here is an sp3 carbon and it doesn't participate in the double bond which means that our bonding system is only half as big as it was before this is now symmetrical but um, in the enol form where this one of these two oxygens is protonated so we shift a hydrogen from here across to here that happens in water very easily um, it doesn't happen in other solvents quite so easily we can make the enol form which has got the same uh, atoms in it is just organized slightly differently and this has a strong optical absorbance if we put some oxygen in there the oxygen can be excited by this dye so this dye gets excited by the light the light excites the sorry the excited dye excites oxygen into its more reactive state and it gets attacked here the oxygen actually attacks onto here and blocks this molecule and prevents it from forming back into the colored state so in this case we can say the bigger the pi system is the more likely it is to absorb uh, visible light and the redder the light 
it will be that it does absorb. So if we take a single benzene ring, it only absorbs ultraviolet light. You can detect it very easily in ultraviolet light. Caffeine, for example, has, uh, it has a nitrogen containing ring, but it's only one. If we make it bigger, it will absorb blue light. And as it gets bigger and bigger, it will absorb more and more light towards the red. The brown component in T, which I'm trying to avoid in my experiment, or um, the brown component in trees, is a very large polymer of rings and double bonds, which makes it absorb lots of colors of light and appear to be dark brown. So the tannins in tea and the lignin in wood are dark brown because of a long double bonded structure that can absorb the light at different frequencies and blocks it almost completely in that case.